When it comes to technology, usually people want the latest and greatest. So why are vinyl records making a comeback? For some people, it never went away. Putting a needle in a groove of a vinyl disc to create music doesn't seem to make any sense at all. Also, it's more work flipping a disc to listen to the B-side than pushing a button for your custom playlist. Vinyl seems so antiquated, and yet millions of people are rediscovering the magic, and millions more are exploring it for the first time. You're seeing the groove with a needle go into it, violently dragged across it, and beautiful, subtle sounds come out. It's like you're raking your front lawn, and while you're raking it, the sound of the rake is Beethoven. But is the magic a passing fad? I saw a vinyl of a Smashing Pumpkins album, and they were my favorite band at the time, and I said, okay, I guess I collect records now, and I bought it. <laughs> this was one of the top best sellings back then. Everybody loved it. People are realizing that the old technology may actually offer some advantages over the new. Hello, how y'all doing? Poop, poop first. Old record stores are busy again during this revival of vinyl. This one is B.B. Um, King and Bobby Blue Band back together. People have asked us, why didn't you close down? But we like the music, and people love the music. And you have to realize, most people, the records, they are joy to them, like kids with a new toy. This is uh, Yanku Dumitrescu, a great uh, Romanian avant-garde composer. This is a Prince Farai, Peter Brotzman record called Machine Gun. This is a Sun Ra record. This is a Joe McPhee's classic Nation Time from 1971. From when I was a kid until now, one of the things that continues to fascinate me about records is that they're magic. <laughs> They're like an open magic trick. You know, magic is usually something that magicians keep to themselves. They have their secrets, et cetera. And all music that's recorded has some magical quality. If you're listening on a computer, it's not like you're sitting and watching the computer do its business. You just press a button and music comes out. John Corbett needs a ladder to retrieve one of the 12,000 albums sorted by genre and artist. Yes, it requires some effort to start the music, but for Corbett, it's worth it. Wide Willie Johnson, one of the all-time greats. His collection of jazz and blues includes rare records, some worth hundreds of dollars. It all starts in childhood with Batman and Robin. Batman and Robin record was like a narrative record, but it had musical interludes. And the musical interludes, it turns out, were by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Sun Ra is significant for a lot of reasons. He was one of the great band leaders, pianists, and avant-garde musicians of the 20th century. Albums are like a time capsule of music. But that's never the intention when a French inventor devises the first recording device in 1857, and Thomas Edison improves that with the phonograph in 1877. The very first thoughts that folks like Edison had about what you would use recorded sound for was to record people's last words. That was the number one thing. Music was like 25th on the list of things that you would use it for, and now, of course, Recorded music is the number one thing that recording is used for. There's something material there. It's not binary numbers. It's, it's actually something physical that you're interacting with. Albums uh, that are 
limited edition with, you know, marbling or Haley just... Bob Link is a collector oh and a seller, dealing mostly with 70s and 80s albums. So are you just an old soul? <laughs> I guess that's a good way to, to How did you discover it. New Wave? Um, I grew up listening to my parents' music. Uh, they really liked the Cars and the Smiths. I uh, started listening to their library of music first, and I just really fell in love with a drum machine. But now I know more than them about <laughs> 80s music. She buys from garage sales or online. It's just nice to have a physical copy of something in your hands and being able to hold it and flip through it. I also think that younger people today really just enjoy being able to listen to their music all in one place. And that was easy for a while digitally, but now it's becoming harder and harder. It's really gone full circle to the album being the easiest place to have all of your collection in one spot. Haley sells online, but you can still find an actual record store like Out of the Past Records on Chicago's West Side. Everybody obsessed with Al Green. I remember the snow, the snow in 1967 that shut Chicago down. They say they, they blame him for all the new babies that came in at that year. <laughs> Charlie Henderson opens in 1966 and remains open even when LPs are no longer in vogue. And he always said, nothing will never go out of style. It was like every generation, something would come in and then something would go out. But then it would resurface again. If it sold, he would make sure he wasn't going to run out of it. So that's why I got all these records here. <laughs> <laughs> Earth, Wind, and Fire was a good group because oh, yeah. a lot of young kids like that. Uh, After her husband fire. dies, Marie yeah. and granddaughter oh, Anissa it. decide to keep the store running. Muddy Waters. There are two sections, alphabetical order. Let's see what this one is. And complete disorder. Um, when we used to purchase them. From the distributor? Yes. And so, so you have boxes that have not been opened in decades. Yes, we have tons of them. We have some out on the floor, but most of them are back in our storage room. So this is how they would come in the box. So this is the impressions. Most buyers like to come in and dig. They don't like for stuff to be in order. It's like finding a treasure for them. Yeah, Al Green, Smokey Robinson. Jane Chandler. When people first come in here, they be like, oh, well, I got to come back. I didn't know I was going to be in here this long, so. <laughs> <laughs> Usually when people come, they spend most of the day with us. This stuff will never go out of style because we teach them young so they are know good music. You got soul and everybody knows that it's all right. Whoa, it's all right. We got like thousands of Lionel Richard and Commodores. I think my grandfather went crazy when <laughs> they came well, out. Well, he's got good taste. Whether you're looking for Motown from the Henderson's record store, or 80s New Wave from Haley's website, or obscure jazz from John Corbett's music library, your collection should be personal. John Corbett says there's more to a record collection than filling shelves. You have 12,000 albums. What is the difference between a collector and a hoarder? <laughs> uh... Well, for the difference between a collector and a hoarder, you should not ask my wife. <laughs> that I recommend. Um, <laughs> collecting should be a very highly personalized experience. It should be something that you do that tells you something more about yourself. And I learned that I was really, really interested in other cultures through records. You know, this is ethnographic records, um, international music. But is the idea of investing in an album extinct? Is vinyl a passing fad? The one thing that I always say is fidelity is on our side. It, it sounds better. Andy Weber doesn't think so. He's started a company, Smashed Plastic, which makes albums for new artists and new fans. You remember when we were kids, everybody would go, oh yeah, I own that record. And then my friend pulled out his phone and said, well, I own every record. 
And that just blew my mind. I was like, this is, there's something wrong with this. The biggest thing to me is vinyl is something tangible. You actually own it. You know, as opposed to streaming something that's sitting on a server somewhere in the middle of a desert, you actually own that record and something happens when that needle hits the record that's sonic, that actually plays. We live in this crazy world where you can pull up a song in a second, listen to it in your car. This is a, I'm sitting down, I'm slowing down, I'm putting a record on for 45 minutes and it's, it's, a, it's a decompress. It's interesting that the younger generation is willing to do that. It just seems... I think they need to, <laughs> yeah. Making records is not a fast or simple copy process. It's a complex mix of art and science. So it's PVC granulate. You know, we get people who have never pressed something to vinyl, but maybe they've been a band for 20 years. And we, we get hugged, we've seen tears, the excitement is second to none, and that makes it fun to come to work every day. One of those bands making records at Smash Plastic is Rookie out of Chicago. While the record album itself offers fans art, lyrics, and other things you can't feature on a thumbnail, lead singer Chris Devlin says the concept of an album also allows for more artistic expression for the musician. As a musician, you think to yourself, how do I want that song to end and then the needle to pick up and move back? And then you flip it and then there's another experience that's going to happen. So it's definitely part of what musicians do. They need the physical album with the A, B. That's how most of our heroes did it and that's how they formatted their art, so you kind of want to emulate that. Vinyl distortion. Is it a distracting noise or nostalgia? Sometimes the beauty of sound is in the ear of the beholder. But it's not just the audio. People are recognizing convenience isn't always the best experience. This artifact may have been created by an artist, but your collection can say a lot about you. How you dress, who you date. For me, it's been that all along. It's about discovering things that I didn't know about and sharing them with other people who also didn't know about them. That's the most fun you can possibly have with a record collection. My advice is to start doing it and see what turns you on.